Okay, we're live and welcome to the John Riley Project. And I am very pleased to have as my guest the legendary sports talk radio NFL play by play icon here in San Diego, Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. How you doing, Lee? John, this is great. This is technology squared for me. This is so unique to be able to do something like this aside from just doing sports talk radio, opening up the phones and battling with the fans every afternoon. So this is a very, very different world that we're living in right now, technically. So looking forward to exploring this and walking down the road with you. Right on. So welcome. Yeah, welcome into the, the studio here. And we just had a great conversation sharing some of the gear here. But, you know, I'm just really interested in talking to you about your background, your history. I mean, I know you got started in, in sports radio, um, you know, many years ago and worked your way to Phoenix and San Diego. Maybe you can just kind of walk us through your career. Grew up in a sports and journalism family. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was a pitcher in the Philadelphia Athletics Organization, never made it to the show. Uh, uncle that was a very famous sports writer and a World War II journalist. Uh, so I grew up in that environment and I went off to college. I grew up on Long Island went off to college and wanted to be a newspaper reporter and be a sports columnist. I just, that's all I ever did my whole life. Went to college and got sidetracked and got into the electronic end of the business and mm -hmm. went to Ohio University, which had a great school of communications and got involved in radio and stayed in radio, worked in radio while I was going to university. Uh, started, this sounds like tons of time ago, and that probably was, started in commercial radio in 1968 in a small market station in Appalachia while I was going to school, while I was going to graduate school, and worked four years in small market radio and did everything and learned everything and became a program director and a disc jockey and did high school sports and, and then got the chance to move to upstate New York to do mid-market radio and got involved in sports talk radio there. And got involved in doing minor league hockey. And that kind of set sail on, on the rest of my career. Wound up in Cleveland. Spent seven years in Northeast Ohio in Cleveland and Akron and did major league hockey and did sports talk radio. Mm -hmm. uh, lost my job first of many times when <laughs> formats got changed. Right. Uh, went from there to Phoenix. Phoenix was at the other end of the world. But, you know, the industry, John, is it's all about networking. Who you know, where you are, right time, right place, right situation. I wound up going to Phoenix and got to Phoenix in 1981 and had an opportunity to go into a big time news talk station, did sports talk. Nobody had really done it like that before and became the voice of the Arizona State Sun Devils, pioneered sports talk radio, built an empire there. And by accident, guys in San Diego heard me. And out of the clear blue sky, I got a phone call one afternoon from, at that point, the owners of the old Extra 690 and asked me if I'd consider coming to San Diego because they knew all about my career as a talk show host, a play-by-play -play guy, to be the voice of the San Diego Chargers. And we walked through the whole process of who they were and who I was and what I thought was really important, got hired on the spot, came here, became the voice of the Chargers, worked, worked at the legendary 690 as it evolved from extra gold rock and roll to news talk sports, then to all sports. And I was the first cornerstone piece of what would become the legendary sports talk station. You probably heard the first time you heard me. And from, from that had a huge run there. And unfortunately it dissolved Cor uh, corporate radio ruined it and went across the street to what was then the mighty 1090. Did another tour of duty there, uh, went to the NFL, went back to the NFL after I lost my Chargers opportunity, went to Seattle, did the Seahawks, did USC football, and stayed in the market. I kept turning down all these jobs from all these other stations around the country. So I stayed there, and then I got to 2014, and it, it all kind of evaporated in 1090, went down the drain, and um, I lost my gig there. Went across the street, dabbled in television, did TV sports anchor for three years at CW6, had a blast, learned a lot. They dissolved that news department, went across <laughs> the street to KUSI, right. been doing some freelance stuff, helping them in sports. Uh, all, in, all in the mix of this, I started my own website, which has been pretty successful. It's a one-man show. It's all written. It's very different. 
LeeHacksawHamilton.com. I write on it every day. So uh, I've done a lot of unique things. Uh, wish I was still doing it full time, but the landscape of my industry has changed. I like what I'm doing. I loved what I did in the past. Wish it had worked out well towards the tail end, but it did not. But boy, it did a lot of things. Not bad for a kid that grew up on Long Island. Now, I will tell you this. I cut my teeth on news talk sports in the New York City market because I grew up on the island. Mm -hmm. So I had listened and I had theories about what I thought was good radio and I had the chance to do it. I mean, and, and to be able to do what I did from 1968 through 2017 when my last TV opportunity dried up and to, to be the voice of an NFL team, I did major league hockey and, and broadcast college football and went to the Rose Bowl, and went to the Super Bowl. That's pretty cool. And I will tell you, my industry, as you well know, uh, my industry is really, really volatile right now. Uh, but boy, I wouldn't trade one second for all the things I experienced. I, I look back and say, yeah, we did some really, really neat things, met a ton of people, interviewed a zillion people. Wasn't a phone number in the world that I didn't want to call. Uh, you know, and I love to write, which was important because it allowed me to do a lot of freelance writing and and then, then obviously use that as a stepping stone to actually start my own website. So done a lot of things. Uh, really thankful for the opportunity that I've had to be able to continue to do it. And to this day, to a different degree, still doing it. Well, right on. I mean, I, I, I discovered you, I think it was in 1989. Um, and uh, you blew me away. I mean, this is in the pre-internet days. And you just had so much facts, so much information. And then, of course, all the opinions. I mean, it was fantastic. And so I've been following you since then. And uh, man, this is fantastic that you're here joining us. Yeah. It, you know, people have asked me, I've, I've done a series of interviews about the growth of sports talk radio in San Diego and what happened and what's happened around the country. And people said, how did you come up with the shtick that you came up with? And I, I tell people, I, A, I was a uh, news talk sports information junkie as a kid growing up. Mm -hmm. So that was my standard. I just had a desire. I had a need. My mandate was, I want to know everything that's going on. And then as I evolved into sports talk radio, uh, I want to know everything that's going on so I can tell you. And you can now finally admit to me that you love being in gridlock at four o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> yeah. in yeah. Los Angeles so that you could All hear right. what I had to say. Mm -hmm. And then just to be fortunate enough uh, to be given the freedom to do what I thought was really important. And that that's a piece of the equation that, unfortunately, I don't think we see now in what Sports Talk Radio has become. But I created it. I I grew on it. I think I was the Internet before the Internet. Yeah. Well, you are the franchise, right? Yeah. That's what it says on the nameplate. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so I, you know, I was bombastic. Uh, I was bleeping brilliant. Uh, I've done an enormous amount of information. I just know what I know. And I'm glad to share it with people. And then. And then as, as we evolved Sports Talk Radio, I, I thought the most important things were what I knew, what I passed on, and what you were going to say to me when you called uh, to participate in the show because I made my listeners the co-host. And it is unbelievable the people that I cross paths with who listened to us in the early days of the old Extra Sports 690, including the owner of the Padres, Peter Seidler, who at that point was involved with Dodger ownership in Los Angeles. And he, first time I ever met him, I, I didn't know him. He knew me. He knew everything I'd done. Mm -hmm. He said, I couldn't wait to get on the 405 at 4 o'clock, regardless of the traffic, so I could listen to the best 15 minutes in radio. That's kind of cool. Uh, and I, I used a whole bunch of things I did as a springboard to go do other stuff. I wound up working at Sirius XM part-time on the Home Plate Baseball Channel, doing a national talk show around the globe. Think about that. I did I did their Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night shows uh, on, on Sirius XM. Did them for three and a half years before they merged and the job went away. So I had the chance just, just to experience a lot of different things. So it, it's really been fun. But allow being allowed to package a show the way I wish to package it. Don't tell me what I'm doing wrong. Just leave me alone. Let me do it. And we'll have revenue success and we'll have rating success and people will remember what we did forever. They still talk about the junk that I did in Phoenix at KTAR, <laughs> the legendary news talk station. Mm -hmm. And I can't go anywhere. I live in Rancho Bernardo, like you live in Poway. I can't go anywhere without people stopping me to say, 
oh, I listen to you all the time. And do you remember when you did this? Or I called you, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and then they start, they bring it up all the colloquialisms, things that I used to use as brand statements to incite the, the listeners. And so it, it was a tremendous run. And I just, I created stuff on the fly. And I, I know you're going to ask me about uh, how did I develop the, the psyche of what I was going to do on the show. I drove when I, I lost my job in Cleveland after the, the hockey leagues merged, the NHL and WHA. I lost my hockey play-by-play job and my uh, sports talk show job because the station changed format. I got hired immediately to go to Phoenix. And I drove from Phoenix to Tulsa the first day. Tulsa across Oklahoma and Texas. Mm-hmm. And got to New Mexico the second day. And I drove the Flagstaff, turned left, came down the hill to Phoenix. Well, during that whole process of me driving, I kept trying to create what I should be, how I should sound, what I wanted to talk about when I went to Phoenix. And all these light bulbs went on because I was driving by myself. Everything I owned was in my Plymouth Horizon. And I, I came up with this theory of how to package what I wanted to say and how to get you to respond. And I hit the floor running the first night I was on the air in 1981 and did all that. And then I got hired to come to San Diego. And that was a whole unique story about how I wound up here and what I had to do to become great here. But I had the benefit of working for big stations with monster signals and also being the first guy out of the box to do it. And that, that to me, is more important than anything else, that people could hear what I was doing and those people were of the opinion, God, this guy is really different. And then you get them addicted to listening. Whether they liked you or not, John didn't matter. As <laughs> long as they listened every day at four o'clock and as long as they called the talk show. And if I go back in the history of our ratings and revenue success, what we did in Phoenix, we pioneered a great news talk station that still operates to this day. What we did in San Diego with the original Extra 690, then what we reincarnated with with Double X 1090, Nobody's ever been able to duplicate that. And it, it's kind of neat. I, when I listen, I, I hear these stations trying to do what we did, you know, and that includes a nine hour game day broadcast as the voice of the Chargers. And we just did so many cool things. So it's, I'm really proud of, of where I got to, but also thankful. I was really allowed to don't tell me what to do. This is what I do. And they didn't interfere with me hardly ever. So it's kind of it's kind of novel. Right on. I mean, I, I have a bunch of questions I want to ask. Fire you, away. But uh, I want to just tell the audience we're we're happy to take your questions on the live stream. If you have a if you have a question for Hacksaw, just type it in on Facebook or on YouTube. It'll show up here on the screen, and uh, I'll read them uh, to, to Hacksaw and get his answers to your questions. Do we have any up here that? Uh, I think people are just excited to see it. That's yeah. a, people are going hacksaw, hacksaws on. So this is great. Listen, don't hit the wrong button. That red button, keep your finger off that red button because I don't want you to start a, a war with North Korea. <laughs> so take me, like, the, when you were doing Chargers play by play, now you had Laslovic and was, was Chet on the team with you there for a while? Well, let me let me give you a little background about how I wound up here at 690, first of all, because it's 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 a wild story and I've not told it very often. I was in Phoenix at KTAR, had been there seven years, did Sun Devil football, had built a huge reputation as a sports talk show host. The best thing to happen to me is getting to Phoenix. All these bad things happened in the world of sports as I arrived. This was May of 1981. I walk in there and they had done sports talk at night. And there are only two things in, in Phoenix at that time, the NBA franchise, Phoenix Suns, and Arizona State football. They owned the market. Mm-hmm. There was no baseball. There was no NFL at that point. And I got hired by KTAR to come in to change what they were doing. Everybody, there were a couple of sports talk shows there, and there was mom and pop radio. Everything is beautiful. <laughs> well, I get to Phoenix, and the Suns were the number one seed in the entire NBA playoffs, had home court advantage forever. And I got beat in the first round. I get to Phoenix, Arizona State, which was a national football power, got put on NCAA probation for just a wide variety of things that the Sun Angel Foundation had done and the, the coach Frank Cush had done. I get to Phoenix, and they shut down baseball with a bad, bitter strike in 1981. So That's I walk right. in the front door in Phoenix, and I, I tell myself, I have to hit the floor running. What am I going to do? Well, as my long drive from Cleveland to Phoenix, I decided that front end of my show is going to be 
the best 15 minutes in radio. And I was, I was going to catch your attention from the minute you turned on the radio. And that's where the whole thing was. Here's what's going on in the world of sports. Here's what Lee Hamilton thinks. Damn it. That's where that came from. <laughs> right. And, and the high speed sports wire mm -hmm. where that came from and why I grab you by the shirt and you got to stay with us for four hours, which is in a ratings business time spent listening huge. Right. So I created this aura and then I backed it up by just being bold. And I was going to say things that had never, ever been said before and bingo. Uh, I got response. So I walk in the door in Phoenix in May of 81 and all this stuff is happening. And my first night on the air on a 50,000 watt regional station is busting everywhere with a signal. My first night is how the hell could the Phoenix Suns number one seed screw this up so badly? <laughs> Who are you going to hold accountable? Yeah. This is from, this is in a market where everybody was bowing down to the Phoenix Suns organization. And people went crazy that I was challenging the Suns as to how you could allow this to happen. Mm -hmm. And then I went after Arizona State in the same sentence. And I, by the way, Sun Devil fan, uh, get off your ass and get on the air. Tell me this. Why do you have to cheat? Why does Arizona State, with this, all the facilities, averaging 72,000 fans per game, beautiful campus, all this wealth, Sun Angel Foundation and all that, why do you have to cheat? You know, you need to fire the coach. I, I said that. Nobody had ever taken on Arizona State. And then baseball went out on strike simultaneously. And KTAR was the flagship in Arizona of the Dodger baseball network, Fernando Valenzuela and all that. Yeah, yeah. And carried the Dodgers for a long time. Yeah. So I'm on the air and I'm just railing against the commissioner, railing against the union, mm -hmm. just inciting everybody. The best thing that happened to me, aside from getting to a big station with a big signal, because I had been on a big signal in Cleveland doing hockey, they had 51 straight nights of me, four hours a night, 6 till 10 p.m., putting topics on the table and yelling at them. And, <laughs> and then the newspaper yeah. did me a favor. They came after me, and they created all this havoc. I got involved in this big war with a radio TV columnist of the Arizona Republic and the Phoenix Gazette, and they were banging on me for being rude and crude. And who is this guy? And why would he say that about our teams in town? So they're publicizing the daylights out of my show as I'm going after them every night. So the best thing that happened to me was May 1st, 1981, the world changed. And I was the guy that walked around with the matches and kept throwing it on the fire. <laughs> so I did that for seven years. And it was, it was a great run. And we, we had some great times and we had some bad times and all that. And then it was time to go. And now to revert back to your question, how did I wind up here? I got a phone call in 1987 from the owners of Extra Sports 690. And it was called the Noble Broadcast Group. They owned 18 stations around the country, small market ownership group. This guy calls me and he says, Lee, I know who you are. We know what you've done. I represent Extra Sports 690. We just got the rights to the San Diego Chargers of the NFL. We are going to take our big signal station and make it a news talk sports station. We'd like you to be the first piece of that. Come do afternoon drive. Come be the voice of the Chargers. Help create this big pregame show, postgame show, etc. So I wound up coming here. Now, when I got here, it wasn't easy because they were still 69 extra gold, old rock and roll, right. Wolfman Jack and all that. Right. And I was the only guy with any sports background walking into the building. And I've been given carte blanche to create this game day with nine hours, big pregame show, play by play, big post game talk show. And I had to find guys that could fit in and be part of it. So we went ahead and did that. It was really tough the first year because I was the only guy in the building. I was a one man island. And it, there were points in time, and the team wasn't very good. There were points in time I said, boy, did I make a mistake coming over here because I'm not making any headway and everything's a struggle. But eventually the station evolved. Uh, and they decided to get rid of the 69 extra gold format because music on AM didn't work any longer. Right. And they evolved into News Talk Sports. Uh, they, they got some really unique names to be part of the first station, Extra News 690. And if they had stayed at it, it would have been fabulous, but they didn't stay at it. At one point early, uh, this probably was about 1989, they decided to go news talk sports. 
and I was the first ingredient. And then they, they got access to a, a young talk show host out of Sacramento. They got the rights to Rush Limbaugh. Mm. Then they got Larry King out of New York, syndicated show. Then they got Dr. Laura, who was just beginning right. her thing. So they packaged all that with me, with the Chargers and news blocks. And it would have been great. And they didn't stay with it. They only stayed with it for nine months, which was unfortunate because I think it could have been a legendary station. Uh, but they bounced from that. They, then they evolved to go uh, total all sports. Funniest aspect in my, com my first conversation with the 690 people was that I didn't understand what they were asking me. And I said, could you tell me who is a noble broadcast group and what are the call letters? XTRA, that's, that's Mexican. Right. He said, yeah, we're a Mexican, we're owned by Mexi a Mexican corporation. And we operate and we have our tower and transmitters down in. So the Rosar blowtorch signal. Blowtorch, Rosarito Beach. Yeah. So I said, no, wait a minute, time out. I said, you want me to come work for a Mexican station, be the voice of the Chargers and do sports talk? Yeah. I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> I thought they wanted me yeah. to broadcast in Spanish because it was a right. Mexican licensed Spanish station. I said, no, no, we're building studios in San Diego. We're going to take it news talk and uh, et cetera. So, so it was funny. And I, so I came over here. They gave me carte blanche. They mandated that I create all this programming. And then we had to hire the right people uh, to be on the Charger broadcast team. A uh, lot, lot of work, really hard. And I was doing four hours. I was doing four hours a night by myself. I was booking all the guests by myself. I was doing the whole show by myself. And I was doing all my game prep. So I was working nine days a week. But, uh, you know, it took us a while to get traction. And the team wasn't very good. And we stuck with it. We stuck with it. And we kept, we kept making progress. But the thing I'd never realized was 690 was a 50,000-watt blowtorch up the coast. And I had no idea the, the, the penetration of the signal into Orange County and then the penetration to Los Angeles. And I, it, then it really dawned on me, you know, we go back to this whole imagery thing. How are you going to present what you're going to do? And that's where I came up with the theory from Baja to the Canadian Rockies. It's a classic line. And it's yeah. true. Yeah. Because I, I had been in the Pacific Northwest. I had been up in Spokane. Yeah. I heard 690 at night in Spokane. It was amazing. With, and I had friends in Vancouver who heard it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's all how you package what you package, but you have to, have to be in the right place, right time, right, right situation. So I, I, I did it for a long time. We had a tremendous run. Chargers got good, got to the Super Bowl. What an experience for our community. It's probably much like when the Padres got to the World Series the first time, I guess, in 84 against the Tigers and the second time when they did it against the Yankees. And so we, we just had a tremendous run. We shocked when it ended. Uh, the Chargers elected to leave our station after they had that big Super Bowl run, and we kind of got left off to the side, unfortunately. And Chargers were never, ever the same again in terms of having a good radio partner. Uh, but I sat there and I watched them grow that station. And I sat there and watched them hire these people. And as we were working so hard, we had no idea that we were creating a sports talk legacy that probably will never, ever be created again. But if you look at the people that we had as teammates at 690, I mean, it was it was just spectacular. So that's how I got here. That's what we did along the way. And I, I was allowed to do what I thought was really important. And that was that was the content. And that was how I packaged it. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, this is a big signal. You know, I'm getting calls from Rams fans and Dodger fans right. and then from the Raider Nation. And mm -hmm. I just, I used to go to war with those people all the time. You know, Raider Nation out of jail on bail, call now. <laughs> or call in on a stolen cell phone and a stolen car. Right, to talk right, to you. right. And so it just, it rolled and it went on and on and. So I look back now on the legacy and all my friends in the broadcast industry look back and say, boy, you guys really did it. And management would say, we have this blueprint. Yeah. Right. Well, I'll tell yeah. you, they had no bleeping blueprint. They were, they were doing it by walking down the, the hallway, trying to figure out what to do. And they stumbled upon talent. I mean, they knew who I was, but then they stumbled upon Jim Rome and he just became an icon, a little different style, which is fine. And then they stumbled upon Chet Forty, and then they stumbled upon Steve Hartman, and they stumbled upon Philly Billy Werndell, and and 
Scott and BR kind of came late to the party, but before that there had been Mason and Ireland who left, who were there and then left and had, have had really good success in Los Angeles. They'll say, Oh, it's part of the blueprint. Say you're full of crap. It was not part of the blueprint. You stumbled upon virtually all these people, but it really worked out. And the thing that made the original 690 so successful is that John, we all came at it from different angles. Now, you might have loved me. You might have hated Rome. That doesn't matter because Romy had his whole entourage and they loved him and they hated me. And that was cool. All the clones. Oh, the, that's, that's right. And I, I was responsible mm -hmm. for all those nicknames. I, I, you know, I call them the Yablas because they used to tie <laughs> up the fax machine and send, send Jim all these faxes. You couldn't get anything accomplished at work because the Yablas, the Jobless, were faxing them every minute of every day. And then and then Steve Hartman came almost by accident from Los Angeles, and he got he got linked up uh, finally with Chet Forty, and it was it was just a perfect perfect hire, and I, they were just firing shots at everybody. I walked down the hallway one day, I see a bunch of loose cannons insulting everybody, you know, and loose cannons stuck. Really, you you were the one. I was the one who called them the loose cannons right, right out of the gate, so. You know, we we had just really good people, uh, very different people. But the talk shows were so diverse that you had to listen to every day part to see what the next guy was going to say about what the last guy said. And everybody it was had... really innovative yeah. because no one had ever done sports like that. I mean, we had had, you know, there's always been, you know, talk radio talking about news and politics mm -hmm. and stuff. But 24 seven sports all day. And, and like you said, every one of these guys that got behind the microphone, they became celebrities here in the sports community in Southern California and have gone on to a lot of other things and different varying levels of success. But you walked in the door as an island, a one man yeah. show. And so how do you how do you put together a nine hour Sunday broadcast and you just how do you? How do you do that, like by yourself? What what is in my DNA? Sports information. So when they sat me down, they said we have to build a big pregame show and the play by play and a postgame show because we need to have avails at, to sell to advertisers because they were paying such a big rights fee. And I had done the same thing at Arizona State. We I had created after we got the rights at, at KTAR, I created Sun Devil Saturday. That's what we called it. I said, let's do countdown to kickoff. I said, I'll devise, we wound up doing a two hour pregame show. I'll devise nine different segments. It's interviews, it's it's a player interview, a coach's interview, it's the opposing play-by-play -play interview, it's it's a package thing with the opposing coach talking about the game, it's it's the Chargers coach's interview, it's the interview with the general manager, Bobby Bethard. So after a while, all of a sudden you got all this content, nine different programs. By the way, sales guy is running up and down the hallway loving it because now he's got different content to sell that had never, ever been done before. And then I said, after the game, what we really want to do is keep people listening, time spent listening, mm -hmm. keep them coming out of the stadium, punching up the car phone and listen to the postgame show. We had a number of different guys that did the, the postgame show. I, I started, uh, I anchored the pregame show and I got some people to voice track different segments. Then I did the play-by-play, -play, and then I stayed did another hour post-game talk show, but that that was so I could I could control the content and how it should be you know delivered and all that, and the thing really worked. People were coming out of the game. The Chargers were losing a lot then. They were coming out, and the first thing they would do was start the engine. Second thing they do is punch up six ninety, and listen to the callers, and so we did that, and we evolved this talk show. So. That, that's how I did a nine hour game day broadcast. And they gave me carte blanche. And I said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to try to make it work. And it worked. Then the team got good. And then the team went to the Super Bowl and they started to win during the, the Bobby Ross, Boss Ross era. And we were off to the races and our radiance were just unbelievable. So you remember, remember back, it was, I think it was in 93 and the Chargers started out 0 4. And then Bether traded for Humphreys. And I think you said on your show that they're going to make the playoffs. And, and sure hell they did. And right after that season, I got season tickets to the chargers and I would, I literally had a little transistor radio 
and I'd hold it up to my ear, sitting in my <laughs> in my chair, listen to you doing play by play while I watched the game at, at Qualcomm. And my favorite phrase was ticket in your left hand, transistor radio in your right hand. And it was. And we did it. We did a video, uh, a little promotion package of all the people sitting in the stands with headsets on. I oh, mean, yeah. it was really cool. It's not that way anymore. So we just we had a chance to do something creatively different. And, and that included coaches shows during the week and the GM show and and. NFL draft. We did a nine hour draft day broadcast draft day. We sat at the stadium in the restaurant there and we brought our whole broadcast team in and we put them up on a podium. And, and that was when the draft wasn't that big of a thing. Well, it was starting to become a big thing, but we did nine hours on draft Saturday it was on and on and on. And it was, it was hard. I think back now and said, boy, what did we ever have the energy to do it? But we were really fortunate. Um, you know, when you flip back and you, and you talk about the guys that came there, I was the first one. And I'll tell you how stupid I am. My whole career has been in broadcasting. John Lynch, the owner, the former Pittsburgh Steeler player, his son is now the general manager of the 49ers. Mm -hmm. John Lynch Sr. brought me over his house over in Torrey Pines and said, Lee, we're going we're gonna to take this station a little bit different direction. I think we're going to go all sports. What do you think? And I was, well, I don't know. I've been brought up in a news talk background. I said, I don't know if sports 24 hours a day works. He said, well, we're going to do it. Well, John was an entrepreneur and a creative guy. He needed people to execute it and pull it off. He would say, do it, and then we'd do it. Sometimes the projects work, sometimes they didn't. But I, I told John, I said, that's kind of narrow cast. You think you can talk sports 24 hours? Not thinking very much about 50,000 watt blowtorch signal mm -hmm. that covered everything and failing to realize it wasn't just going to be about the Chargers and Padres. It was going to be about the Dodgers and the Angels. And it was going to be about the Rams. And it was going to be about the Raiders. And then... I was a hockey guy. So then it was, we also include the Kings and the Ducks along the way. And suddenly you had all these topics on the table you could talk about every day. And, and when they started to put the talk show roster together, uh, it, was, it was weird. They brought in these guys from L.A., Bud Ferrillo, old-time newspaper guy, and a, had done talk radio, sports talk radio to a degree in Los Angeles. And he brought his young sidekick, Steve Hartman, and they really wanted to hire Ferrillo because he had a name, put him on the big signal. And but did, it didn't pan out. But didn't sound right. And but they they, they kind of got excited about Hartman, so they had decided to hire Steve. Well, now they're trying to figure out who they're going to have co-host with Steve. And this is before they launched the the whole thing. They laid laid this groundwork out. And John Lynch knew Chet Forty. For those who are young, Chet Forty was the creative genius of Monday Night Football in the Howard Cosell, Dandy Don, Meredith, Frank Gifford area. He was the guy behind the scenes in the truck that did all the creative stuff. And Chet was a brilliant TV guy. I mean, not, he, did, he, he produced TV newscasts. He produced great events, the coronation, coronation of the Queen in England, uh, the Olympics. He had done so many things. He had run, run into some really bad times in his life gambling addiction and all that the rector's tv career but john knew him so john called him one day and said what do you think about coming out here and doing sports talk on radio we'll just kind of get started and john came to me and i said you know what and i knew chet because i had interviewed chet when he was still doing monday night football and I, I i said john this might really be a brilliant stroke he said why i said well you got a young la guy loudmouth and steve hartman you got an older loudmouth guy in Chet 40. Yeah. You got East Coast versus West Coast. I could see them arguing back and forth, and it was magic right from the start. And Chet was with us for one year. Sadly, he died of a heart attack. And John had to go back into the marketplace and find somebody else. And he came to me, and I said, I got a guy that I use as kind of an NFL insider. He's in Philadelphia, Philly Billy Werndell. I said, he could be an adequate replacement to Chet. Why? East Coast, West Coast, old guy, young guy, both loud. They brought Philly Billy in and bingo. That worked for a whole bunch of years. And then they, they stumbled upon Rome and, and Jim was working nights after me. He had just come out of college and was just trying to find his way. He had a real different approach and that was cool. And they, they brought him in to do nights and then they flipped him to do mid mornings. Uh, and it kind of, they came up with the idea, let's try to syndicate him. Uh, I was the guy that was supposed to be syndicated. 
uh, they had met with me and talked to me about taking my show national. And this is before anybody, before ESPN or anybody. Yeah. And I, we, we kind of got to the finish line of the conversation. I just raised the question. I said, if you're going to syndicate me nationally, uh, is it going to hurt the ratings? Because we we're killing it for the ratings in the afternoon drive. And I said, I need you to think about this. You know, you want me to do a national show and you're going to put me on in Detroit and you can put me on in Green Bay. I said, does it help us a great deal in afternoon drive? If you, I'm getting calls about the Detroit Red Wings or I'm getting calls about uh, the Milwaukee Brewers, I said, does it work? And they kind of stepped back and said, yeah, maybe we don't want to tamper with what we've built. Next thing you know, Rome is the guy and they put Rome on in the morning, nine to noon and kind of got that thing started, took forever and ever. So they, they stumbled across some people. And as you talked about, John, unbelievable chemistry. We didn't necessarily all like each other. We didn't get along all the time, <laughs> but everybody had a different, different sound and a different opinion. And like Romy would say, have a take, don't suck. And it was, yeah, I mean, it was cool. We struggled forever to find a morning show. And then we, we finally found one in Mason and Ireland. And then that was followed by the arrival of Scott Kaplan and Billy Ray Smith, the, uh, loudmouth linebacker and the wide right field goal kicker. And that, that worked really well too. And then, and then we stumbled upon, we wanted something different. We stumbled upon John Cantera, the coach. Mm -hmm. And, and John's had a really nice career. He's kind of been victimized by corporate management too. Uh, but John had, had this angle of, of an insider in high school, knew everybody in the community. He, he brought something into the, the shows that none of us had time to do or wanted to do. So he had his own little entourage of followers too. I mean, it was, it was a tremendous run for 690. And then unfortunately this station got sold. John sold it, went to J-Core. J-Core got gobbled up by Clear Channel. Clear Channel ruined it. And then the rest is history. A bunch of us wound up out in the street. But we have, you know, a whole bunch of us wound up resurfacing pretty quickly. So it was fun how we got to where we got. And it wasn't by any mass blueprint because they knew who I was. And then they found people. And suddenly they had gold. I mean, it was amazing. At the end of the day, I tell people in the broadcast industry, 690 Mexican station where Wolfman Jack used to be the star, 690 became an $11 million radio station in billing. $11 million because of the signal. We were getting money out of Orange County's advertising market, getting money out of L.A., getting national money. And the other stations, they tried to put stations on the air against us, and they, they go off the air in nine months because we had such a stranglehold. And till the day I die, somebody needs to explain to me why Clear Channel Radio, iHeart Media would ever fold 690, an $11 million radio station. They ruined it and they wrecked it. And then, and then John Lynch resurfaced and he started 1090 and that had a nice little run. And that it, it was a successful station for a chunk of time, but landscape changed, rights fees changed, Advertising industry died. It just it just kind of went away, unfortunately, in 2014. Uh, yeah, but they've they've resurrected 1090, haven't they? They've resurrected it, but there's no lo live local shows. Uh, they resurrected it with a lot of of packaging of syndicated shows. Uh, I don't know what kind of listenership they have because they don't subscribe to the ratings. And the marketplace has really really changed. I mean, um, John Lynch started. 97.3 the fan that was his third alliteration mm -hmm. of sports talk radio and 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 that's got the padres now but they don't knock down the kind of ratings that we used to knock down they have a much much smaller signal uh i Heart media clear channel s 1360 which has no listenership and no signal at all uh and so 1090 is on the air the fan is on the air 1360 is just there uh, but it's not like it was before. It's just very different. And losing our NFL franchise, I think, emotionally killed killed the community. And it just infuriated me no end that the Chargers would do what the Chargers did to 55 years of loyalty along the way. But, boy, I'll tell you what, from when I first got here in, in the summer of 87 to, you know, where it was through 2014 when, when I got bought out again, uh, we had a tremendous, tremendous run. We did, did a lot of things in the stories guys start bringing up storylines of, do you remember this, uh, what you said, or what he said, or this win, that loss, that, those coaches, this is so cool. So it's proud to have been part of that legacy. Right on. I mean, tell me a little bit more about, you know, being an NFL play-by-play -play guy. I mean, that's, that's a, 
prime uh, spot. I mean, there's mm-hmm. only 30 of those, right, in the NFL yep. or 32. I don't know what the number is. I mean, what what was that like? It, you know, it, was that like a probably one of the highlights of your career, I'd imagine. Yeah, and I'd never ever imagined I'd wind up in the NFL. My whole theory, my whole goal was to get to the National Hockey League because they came out of a hockey background. Mm-hmm. And then I got sidetracked when the merger took place and Cleveland did not get taken in the merger because they thought they were. I lost my gig and I, I wound up getting a TV gig doing Indianapolis racers hockey in the Wayne Gretzky era. And I, it was disappointing, but you reinvent yourself. And then it, I guess things happen for a reason. I have no idea why I wound up in Phoenix, except that a contact program director who had been in Cleveland really liked my style and he had taken over a KTAR and he called me and I, you know, Phoenix, is the other end of the world. Now guy lied to me. He kept sending me brochures. <laughs> we want you to move to the Valley of the Sun. And they'd mm-hmm. send me brochures of, of Phoenix and golf courses and sunshine and the mountains. And all they neglected to tell me that starting May 1st, it was always 100 degrees. And it stayed that way till October 1st. They forgot to tell me that. I'd never been in that kind of heat. But I went from the worst winters of the world in Cleveland to the worst summers of the world in Phoenix. And I happened to come to America's finest city in San Diego. So it's just, it's weird the way things work out. I'd never imagined uh, I'd get the chance to do this. Like I say, the phone call I got in the summer of 87, come to the, come to San Diego, be the voice of the chargers. I mean, it was, it was amazing. And it just dawned on me. I said, wow, this is cool. And we got to the Super Bowl, uh, you know, and then, then you realize what the community thinks about you and thinks about your team. And I mean, it was, it was just crazy. And uh, I loved it. I love game day. I just live for game day. And after the Chargers left our station and they went to another station and I did not get the chance to go with the package after I'd been promised I would go with the package. I was really disappointed. But within a month, I wound up as the voice of the Seahawks. And I went to I was going back and forth every weekend to Seattle uh, doing NFL football up there and just had a blast and in, in the kingdom and the, they love all oh, the Pacific Northwest. They love the Seattle Seahawks. They weren't real good early on. Then they got good in the Mike Holmgren era when I was there, but then that, that landscape changed and wound up losing that opportunity. So it's just, it's cool. Love game day. I am still a fanatical NFL football fan, but I follow everything. So I'm, I'm fanatical about being fanatical about all the teams that I like to follow and cover and et cetera. So, and I always, always philosophically felt when I was, I was trying to create this aura of what sports talk radio should be. I always philosophically felt I would put every topic on the table. I would cover the waterfront because I knew there would be Padre fans. I knew that we create something with the Chargers. You know, our college football is pretty doggone good. And by the way, I've got the Lakers in LA uh, up in Los Angeles and a huge following. And I was a hockey guy, so I said, we're going to cover the Ducks and we're going to cover the Kings because there's a hockey fan that I need to service. And then I started doing all this other stuff, PGA, golf, and NASCAR, and IndyCar, and I, and I was bold. I'd, I'd call anybody, anywhere, at any time of the day. The station was going crazy. I was calling uh, London, England to chase down Formula One drivers and then boxers. And I, I just... There wasn't a topic I didn't want to talk about because I knew there was somebody out there listening on this big signal to say, hey, that guy, that guy covers my favorite sport. And I knew NASCAR because you would say like Talladega, it'll rip your head off. And and I was just like, who is this guy? I mean, this is awesome. I mean, because you did you put all those topics on the table because normally, you know, we're just getting Padre chargers right before you, you came around. And uh, I mean, it, what you did was so innovative. Um, you built sports talk radio. You built yeah. an empire. I had a very different style and I had a very different idea of content. I always felt that if I could hit your hot button of your interest, whether it's Padre baseball or it's the Chicago Cubs, or that's why I, I do the tour of the training camps. I do the NFL draft preview where we do every team. We did, we did stuff about the NBA. We did hockey draft. If I could hit your hot button, I guarantee you come back to me every day because you weren't going to get it anywhere else. And that's how you build nine and 10 and 11 shares of ratings. And that's what we had in afternoon drive for a chunk of time. So uh, it took a lot of work, but I was really interested because to me, the death of talk radio is if you're talking about the same topic every day, that just, that's a killer. 
I wasn't talking about the same topic every day because it was always something new to talk about. There was always something to creatively talk about. And, you know, people say, well, you can't do that. I had consultants come in and I'd argue with the consultants. They said, don't tell me what I can't do. Look at what I've done. <laughs> you know, they, they would say, you know, nobody wants to cover hockey. When Wayne Gretzky got traded to the LA Kings from Edmonton, we did almost two straight weeks of, of hockey talk in the middle of the summer. It was amazing. When Tiger Woods had his mess, we did weeks of Tiger Woods tales and stories. Uh, it, was, it, it just depends. Here's the content. How do you package it? How do I get that caller on the 405 to react? And so it, it was a tremendous run. I look back now uh, that I got 200,000 miles on me, and I look back now and say, geez, how did I do all this? And, you know, it was funny because, I mean, I was working nine days a week. Because I was I was doing the talk show, I was producing the talk show, which meant I was twenty five different guests a week. I was doing all the research for the talk show. I was doing all my game prep. I was doing San Diego State and the Chargers. Then I was doing USC on radio and the Seahawks. I was meeting myself coming and going in the airport. It, I really wore myself out, but I wouldn't trade it because I was doing what I wanted and I really liked it. And I think for the most part, what we did was pretty doggone good. We pioneered stuff that nobody else was doing. We were. We were the third one in the nation to go to all sports. Uh, WFAN in New York City started the same time I started. Uh, Mike and Mad Dog, uh, Mike mm -hmm. Francesa, Chris Russo are friends of mine. We all started in August of '87, and they had they had a tremendous run. Mike's retired. Chris is still on Sirius XM, and now he dabbles on television again. Mm -hmm. And WIP Philadelphia was the second one, and Extra 690 was the third all sports station in the country. And when we got on the air, we owned the West Coast. I mean, it was it was just tremendous. And I designed what I could do and what I thought was good. Nobody else in management designed very much. It just kind of came along. And then they found talent and they let the talent do their thing. And we were rocking and rolling for a long time. It was it was just a spectacular time. Very, very different right now. Yeah, I mean, the, the, how do you see the whole industry? I mean, where is it going um, how has it changed? I mean, with, you know, with podcasting and there's a, a lot of different approaches now that people are sharing their thoughts and opinions on. on I, I just had a very, John, very different opinion than management did and consultants did. Uh, I would never do things that would take away from people listening to my show. I'm sorry. I was going to grab you by the throat at four o'clock every day. And damn it, you're going to listen every day because I was offering stuff. Mm -hmm. When I take them management came to me and said, we need to do stuff on websites and we need to put podcasts and content on websites. And I said, well, we live and die off the radio ratings. And if you're going to put something on that kind of competes against my ability to get ratings, I'm not sure that that works. It doesn't work for me. And if you're going to recommend that people become selective, well, then it doesn't matter at four o'clock. They won't listen because maybe they could go to the website and they could listen to a piece of it. I said, that doesn't work. And I argued with the Clear Channel people until I was blue in the face in San Antonio. I said, you're, you're being very destructive to your stations. And we went through bad cycles because of what they were doing. Now, podcasts are different now. Talk radio has changed now. Local sports talk in this market's a disaster from a rating standpoint. I also think from a talent level standpoint. Uh, but you go around the country, though, in Boston, they got two sports talkers that are killing it in the ratings. Detroit's number one station is a sports talk FM. Uh, New York is obviously you got WFAN and ESPN FM that are doing very well. Philadelphia is rocking and rolling. Uh, Baltimore, Washington, D.C. has got a, a great sports talk station, WJFK. Seattle's got Cairo, where I used to work freelance. Los Angeles doesn't have good ratings. I don't understand why they do what they do and who they have on, despite the fact they have the Dodgers and, and the Rams and the Clippers and hockey. And I don't, I don't understand that whole philosophy there, but um, I felt bad here. This market, I think died when the Chargers left, but corporate radio came in here and I think wrecked what had really, really been special. And I just, I can't forgive them for what they did because they put a whole bunch of really good people out of work. And they replaced it with junk. And there's still a lot of junk on the air right now. But it's a it's a different time, and I understand that. I'm not bitter. I'm just kind of disappointed at, at what the format, at least in our market, 
has evolved into because I go to other places and I don't, I, I listen to sports talk radio all the time and I don't see that in a lot of other markets, but it's happened here and it's here has never recovered and, and maybe losing our franchise. One of the franchises has got something to do with it, but you need a corporate philosophy of I'm going to talk about everything and you need to be on a big signal, which we, we really were. And if you look at the big stations around the country that are still getting five shares in sports talk radio, they're all on really good signals. So a number of things here kind of hurt, hurt the format, but boy, you can't take away what we did. And what we did was so unique and so different. And while we were doing it, I don't think we ever realized we'd become iconic. We were just going to work every day and creating on the run. But as you say, each of those shows had a real different set of personalities, mm -hmm. different philosophies, different styles. And to me, it's like five flavors of ice cream. That's what made it really, really good. I mean, I just remember when you were doing play by play for the Chargers and there was one game, they were playing the Seahawks and they were on their own one yard line and Humphreys hit Tony Martin. What was the line that you had then? It was, it was like the third down play and we had to win and we were getting our butts kicked up there. Uh, they were blitzing the hell out of him. We couldn't pass block to protect Humphreys. And Humphreys was just a courageous quarterback. He'd stand in the pocket. And he'd make plays to take hits. And we got pinned back to the one-yard line. And they were blitzing, and he was getting knocked down on every play. And so they had a th it was a third down at, at the one going the other way. And I said, third down in 99. And yeah. I turned to Pat Curran, and I said, what do you do? And Pat said, throw it. And I turned to Jim Laslovic and I said, what do you do? He says, throw it deep to Tony Martin. And they ran a slant and Seattle blitzed him in the end zone. And Stan stood in there and hit Tony on a crossing pattern right over the middle. And Tony ran 99 yards for a touchdown. And the team just, it exploded. And then we went on to bury the Seahawks that day. Uh, I didn't devise that play. I said third and 99. <laughs> and next thing you know, the, the ball uh, is in the end zone. But there are people ask me about the Super Bowl season that we had. We never thought we were going to be that good, but it, it just came together and it got better and better as the season went on. And then we won all these big games. You know, we killed the Raiders up in Los Angeles. And uh, I remember their quarterback, I think it was Jeff Hostetler, threw three interceptions. We took back for two scores. We went to Kansas City, which we never, ever won. And we kicked their butt in a penalty-prone game. I'd never, ever seen that kind of stuff on the field. And we had a bunch of flags at the end of the first half and a really nasty incident. And Marty Schottenheimer, the Chiefs coach at that point, came on the field. And, and Humphreys had been taken a pounding. And right before halftime, I think we were losing 7-3. to three. It was just a nasty game. And Stan got blitzed and got knocked down. And as he was getting up, he got kicked by either Derek Thomas or Neil Smith. And I saw it and they threw a flag. And Schottenheimer came storming off the bench, came all the way out to the hash marks, which you can't do that. He was screaming at the refs about Humphreys kicking Neil Smith. It was Neil Smith who kicked him. <laughs> we had a huge right tackle, Stan Brock, six, seven, oh, oh, yeah. great guy. Stan had helped Humphreys up off the ground. He saw Marty coming on the field. Stan crossed the field, and he shoved Marty, almost knocked him down. Another flag. Now, now everybody's pushing and shoving. So they sorted it all out. Nobody got ejected, but there were like four personal fouls, all offsetting. So this is right before halftime. So we sit on the ball. We go to the locker room down 7-3, and Bobby Ross, who is just furious, Bobby's coming off the field, crossing paths with Schottenheimer, and he said something to Marty, and Marty stopped. And they didn't like each other. Bobby was running to, up the a tunnel to go to the locker room at halftime. Fans are going crazy. And he shook his fist at the fans. We came out in the second half. I don't know what he said to the team at halftime. We came out in the second half, and we ran the ball down their throat. We ran them into the parking lot. We beat them. And that was the catalyst. It brought the team together. It galvanized the team. They won for all, all for one. And we went on this tremendous run and got to the – got to the playoffs and beat Miami in the mud and went to Pittsburgh where I thought we were going to get run out of the stadium under the Ohio river and we beat the Steelers at the end of the game. 
and went to the Super Bowl. Unfortunately, we played the greatest offense in modern day NFL football. And Steve Young threw six touchdown passes in the Super Bowl. But I mean, you only experience that once in your life to see a team come together, galvanize themselves, see them galvanize the community. Exactly. Sean, it was yeah. crazy. Yeah. It was right around Christmas time. I used to drive home from the old 690 studios and they see all the hotels and they had Christmas lights in the form of a lightning bolt in all the windows. Town has never ever been the same like that. So uh, it was just a really special time, but those are small windows because teams change injuries. Uh, we had terrible time with we had tragedies. We had, we lost 10 players off that Super Bowl team yeah. who died. Yeah. Uh, a couple of coaches passed on just, it, it's really been tough, but, you never, you never forget the, 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 you never forget the Super Bowl, but you never forget the journey to get to the Super Bowl. And that's my memory. And I was doing stuff for NFL Films Weekly, and and they put out a fabulous video. In fact, if you go on YouTube, and if you type in uh, "Road to the Super Bowl, San Diego Chargers, 1994," they took all our play-by-play -play and they uh, put it together in a package about that Charger run to get to Pittsburgh and win that game is really cool. I didn't even know it existed. And a listener texted me through my website and said, Lee, well, you got to find this out. I just stumbled across this. I said, wow, that's pretty cool. So you never, you never forget the journey. And I've closing comment. I've never forgotten the journey of sports talk radio. What I did never forgotten the run we had with the Super Bowl. Uh, I think of it very, very fondly. And it was, I never thought my career would evolve to what it did, but here we are. But, you know, just the thought about the communities. I remember, you know, right here off the 15 freeway. Remember that double tree golf course that yes. used to be there? They've blown it up. I remember on one of those greens or one of those fairways, when you're driving down the freeway, you saw a huge yellow lightning bolt yeah. and it was cool. Um, the community just really came together. And then after they left, I mean, we all hate the chargers now. I mean, so you're a huge NFL fan still to this day when the chargers are on, what, what do you feel inside? I'm an NFL junkie. I root for Justin Herbert, the quarterback, to go 17-0. I root for Dean Spanos to go 0-17. That's terrible, but that's who I am because of what they did to our community. 55 years of loyalty, dating back to the old AFL. And what, you know, what they did to people in this town and what they did to their employees and what they did to me as the voice of the Chargers and our broadcast team. I could never, ever forgive them. But I, I root, and I, I, there's some people still there that I like, that I, I still deal with. But I root for that kid quarterback because he's really, really good. I just can't root for that owner. So uh, it's a different time. You know, you, you talk about the, the AFC championship game. The funniest story was um, I go to a church, Episcopalian church here in Poway. And on that day, that priest stood at the podium giving his sermon. What's that on your collar? My, my wife was looking at it. What's that on your collar? Guy was wearing a lightning bolt on his collar, giving giving a sermon, hoping that he could get done so fans could go home and watch the game on television right. that day. So, uh, yeah, what a, a great run, great experiences. I've stayed in contact with a lot of those people over the over the many many years. So, if, if you don't mind, if we, I mean, how are we doing on time here? We got uh, we're at uh, like about an hour. Um, but we've got some comments here. Can I read some of the Fire comments? Fire away. Ask a question. I'll give an answer. You don't like the answer. Too so, bad for you. So uh, one of my one of our uh, John Carson on the live stream is like, oh, shit, it's Hacksaw. Um, I mustache a question. Um, you know, give me the classic up and down the coast Hacksaw call. So I think you've already shared that one. Um, you know, other guys saying Hacksaw, this is great. Um, uh, the Miami, he, this is Pete Neal saying the Miami Charger playoff game on Miami. I watched it on TV, but how did, um, how did you handle that game by radio? The, the issue being the player exhaustion. So is he talking about the playoff game in that run or is he talking about the old Kellen Winslow game? No, the, no, there are some great games with Miami. The Winslow Fouts game was before I got here. Yeah. That was part of the whole year of the ice bowl. What was that? 81 or 82. Yeah. Yeah. We went the first time we got to the playoffs in my era was with Bobby Ross and we had played pretty well and we went down to Miami and it was beautiful. And I thought this could be a great game. And right before kickoff, it started to rain and it rained and it rained and it rained, and it rained all day. And we wound up losing 31, nothing. We just could not control it. That was a different year 
than the year we went to the Super Bowl. We played Miami here in the mud. And it's a really funny story is that there was controversy at the stadium because the field had been covered and Shula came in with the Dolphins on Saturday and wanted to do a walkthrough. And it was a huge uproar. So they took the tarp off and he did a walkthrough and it, it, the field was mushy and he drove his golf cart and he, there was divots in the field, et cetera. At the end of that Miami game, they had a chance to win it. Pete Stoyanovich had to kick a field goal out of the torn up section of the field that he had driven his cart on and he missed the field goal. <laughs> Perfect. So, and so we wound up winning that game and going to Pittsburgh and then upsetting the, the Steelers and then going down to the Super Bowl where Steve Young did what Steve Young normally did and tore us apart. So there was a whole bunch of historical perspectives uh, losing in the in the rainstorm to Keith Jackson and Dan Marino that first year mm-hmm. coming back, beating Storjanovich and Don Shula and then obvi- obviously our, our Super Bowl run. So what do you think of the um, the Aztecs' new stadium? It's going to be great. It's great for the university. Uh, I am disappointed. Not that San Diego State got their way and got this thing voted and approved, but I was disappointed. The Soccer City proposal that had been made to buy the land included not only a, a stadium for the Aztecs, but uh, that they would turn over to San Diego State after five years, but it would include a parcel of land still set aside if somebody wanted to come in and build an NFL stadium they could build it there, have to pay for it, but they build it, which would have given us an opportunity to get another NFL team somewhere down the road. Well, San Diego State wound up winning on the ballot, and they got all the land. And the only thing they care about is their football stadium and then all the building it's it's going to go in the next 20 years to increase uh, the enrollment to 45,000. If we had, if the soccer city thing had won, they would have gotten the stadium. They would have owned it within five years. And that parcel of land off to the corner would have been available for somebody to come in and build an NFL stadium. It's, it's so hard for me to believe that eighth market in the country does not have an NFL team. And I don't know how you get an NFL team if you don't have a facility. Now, how do you get the land when they had the land and they let it go? Mm -hmm. Uh, It was just, it was just a bad, bad time. And the guy that owns the team's a bad man. It's all about greed. And I I could never forgive him. I don't think our community could ever forgive Spanos, despite the fact I want them and that kid quarterback to go 17-0. <laughs> well, I, I thought the proposal for the um, for Snapdragon was that they could theoretically like bolt on like more stands to increase it from like roughly 40 to 60. No. Well, yeah. that's what somebody would say. But that's not realistic because your modern day NFL stadiums are 50 to 60,000 with all types of amenities. I'm talking big time skyboxes oh, yeah. and all that. Well, you're not going to do that now. You can't do it. You're not going to rip all that stuff up at Snapdragon. Right. So you could make it an NFL stadium. And by the way, San Diego State does not want an NFL team in this town. They want to be able to control everything and they want to be able to get what they can from corporate advertisers mm-hmm. and box holders and all that. And you bring an NFL team in kind of shoves them to the background again. So I don't think it'll happen. You know, if there's some rich man out there that wants to get the land, build a stadium, and then find the, if the NFL will expand or take somebody else's team, maybe that'll happen. But I don't think that's going to happen in the immediate near future. It's too bad because the original proposal from Soccer City gave us that, that plot of land to find somebody to build a stadium and get a team back. San Diego State's their whole focus is is Snapdragon, and their whole focus is what is going to be great for the, the university in terms of building all these facilities and these classrooms and these offices and hotel and more dorms and all that. So it, I don't think we'll ever see it in our time. I, I know we'll never see it at that site now. Yeah, I, I get you. Do you think they're going to go to the Pac-12? Maybe. Who knows? That's another topic for another time, but... I was I was shocked. It was like a bolt of lightning hit my house at 11 a.m. in the morning when I got this bulletin that USC and UCLA had done a deal. They had worked three weeks to do a deal to go to the Big Ten. Yeah, that was something. Now that story's not been not finalized. That story's not been told because Governor Newsom is to, has taken leading legal action against UCLA for doing this for leaving the the UC system. We have not heard the end of this war. Uh, USC is a private institution. They could go anywhere to play. 
Um, I think it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard on the Trojans to to go to the Big Ten. That's a lot of road trips, and that's that's a lot of time zones. It's a lot of time on planes. Mm-hmm. And by the way, you'll be the target game now for everybody. And you know, you think you're going to Penn State, and it's going to be a nice day. Uh, you think going to Ann Arbor in November, maybe? Yeah. Uh, you're going to play Ohio State in December, maybe? Uh, you ever been to uh, Minnesota and Iowa at the end of the season? You know where winter arrives November first. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a different world. Uh, UCLA's got enormous financial problems. USC this will be good for them in terms of image and in terms of fundraising and all that stuff. I don't I don't know that San Diego State and Boise State make much of a difference uh, in in the Pac-10 the way it's constructed now. And we don't even know if it's going to be the Pac-10. I mean, the big the Big 12 is talking to Oregon and Washington, Arizona and Arizona State. They might take those four. If they took those four, then what's left? And yeah. yet, Aztecs and, and the Broncos could jump and say, well, we're going to be in the Pac-10. But if you don't have the big names, if, if the Ducks and the Huskies are gone and – Sun Devils and Arizona Wildcats are gone, and you already lost the Trojans and Bruins. What's left behind? I mean, are you really a legitimate conference if it's Cal, Stanford, Oregon State, Washington State, Aztecs, and Boise? To me, it's like being in the Mountain West. It's like being in the Old WAC. You become Conference USA. You're not upper echelon. So, well, it's kind of like when they went went to join the Big East, and then the whole thing imploded. That was absurd. Yeah, that's another stupid decision. But this thing has not been told. If the Pac-10 can keep Oregon and Washington and keep the Arizona schools, now, you know, so you got 10. Now you can maybe add the Aztecs, add to Boise, although I don't think they bring very much to the party. But if they do this alliance, there is conversation about a scheduling alliance with the Big 12 or a scheduling alliance with the ACC. And part of it would be TV matchups. You know, I think the world would get excited to see Clemson play Oregon, mm-hmm. see Miami play Washington. Uh, the, the proposal I heard is that everybody would play two non-conference games against the other teams in the other conference. Mm-hmm. You know, if we did the, if we did the same thing with the Big Twelve, we did an alliance with them rather than the Atlantic Coast. Um, you know, maybe you get excited if if you get to see some of the what's left of the Big 12, but there's not much left in the Big 12 with Oklahoma and Texas jumping ship to go to the SEC. So uh, they got two years to figure it out. It's a lot, a lot of things in play. Uh, I'm going to be interested to see because Governor Newsom was meeting, actually meeting today as we talk uh, with with the uh, chancellors uh, about what UCLA did. There may be some legal action taken against UCLA. So it's, it's too bad because when you do this, you destroy rivalries. And what what's part of college football? It's the rivalries. It's mm-hmm. the history. It's what happened in 2000, what happened in 1965. And that means a lot to people at their alma maters, and that's gone. You know, one of the undercurrent themes I hear is that what's left, the Pac-10 schools, are going to refuse to play USC and UCLA. Oh, geez. Refuse to schedule them. Mm-hmm. You know, screw you. Good luck playing in Rutgers. Good luck going to play at Maryland. Um, so it's it's too bad money is driving everything. It's And I, I don't know how they're going to ever, ever solve that. But that's another topic for another time when we do another one of these get togethers is where college athletics is, what now and TV contracts and the money being given to athletes. It's just absolutely phenomenal. That's another topic on another on a table for another night. Well, this, this has been a great conversation, Lee, and I, I, I just want to thank you very much for coming and, and sharing your time and sharing your experience. And, you know, your career is, like I said, when we kicked off the show, you're an icon in this business. Your career is has set the stage and really has been the launching pad for a lot of other people in this business. Well, thank you. It's, it's very kind to say. I never, never thought it would ever be this way, but I'm very proud of what I've done. Not everybody agrees with me. That's fine. That's, that's the Agree world. Agree or disagree. Damn it. I don't <laughs> care. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm so proud of what we've done with Sports Talk Radio. And now it's a different time. And I talk, I talk to guys around the country and a whole guys have had great runs and their careers are now over and kind of mine. It's kind of in the sunset, I guess. 
although I'm still working and doing a lot of things, but really proud of what we did and how the community reacted to what we did. It was just, it was really special. And uh, I thank you for this opportunity. This technology is absolutely phenomenal. So we'll, we will talk again, I guarantee it. Okay. Thanks again, Lee. My pleasure, John. Have a great time. And for everybody who's watched, everybody who's listened, please check my website. It's all written. It's very different. It's the best 15 minutes in sports. It's Hacksaw's Headlines. It's a one man's opinion column. The website is LeeHacksawHamilton.com. And at the end of the day, it proves one thing. If you do it long enough, you should get good enough at it. And I guess we did. Right on. Thanks, John. Thanks, Lee.